Hello, everybody. I uh, hope you can see and hear me. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who is attending uh, this webinar, uh, especially on such a beautiful evening, uh, to come and spend some time with us. Uh, a lot of thanks also goes to uh, people I work with, uh, my PA and the girls up here in the office who uh, really are behind all the logistics of this. Uh, otherwise, I would have no idea how to do this. So thank, thank you so much. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Chad Mahan, one of my partners. Many of you probably know that he's recovering from a bad ski accident. He's, he's actually, from what I understand, doing very well. But he uh, and his PA, Sarah, gave the first one of these Valley Ortho University talks a few months ago. He came up with the concept, uh, which I think is a, a really great way for us as surgeons to educate and connect uh, with the community. Uh, so thank you, Chad, for, for starting this. Um, we are gonna have other talks. I think the next one is in a month and at the very end of this talk, I'll show you a schedule of the lectures and the topics that they'll be talking about. And if there's anything in particular uh, that you guys listening are interested in, let us know uh, and we can have a talk uh, on that topic at some time as well. Um, so we'll get started. I'm going to talk about knee pain. Um, and in college, I was a biochemistry major, and I really didn't like biochemistry, but I loved physiology and I loved anatomy. And that has served me very well because anatomy is really the foundation uh, for orthopedics. And so this part of the talk, I think, is interesting and important. Uh, in this way, you'll be able to understand the topics we'll talk about that can cause knee pain if you understand the anatomy. So what I'm going to do is we're looking, these, these are all of a right knee or right leg, and I'm going to start out wide superficially, and we're going to go toward the center is kind of how we're going to uh, do this anatomy lesson. So this is the back of a right leg. You can see the buttocks up here, the gluteus maximus, the fleshy muscles in the back are the hamstrings, and then in the back of the knee, you see this little space here, and that's where all the bad actors live. That's where the nerve, vein, and artery live. Uh, so we try to stay away from those. But this is also where people can develop what's called a baker's or popliteal cysts. And those cysts usually are not in isolation. There's usually secondary to something else going on in the knee. And then here you can see the calf muscles. And most of the pathology in the knee is actually in front of the knee. So this is looking at the knee, right knee from the front with the muscle still attached. And you can see the big quadricep muscle here. And then the quadriceps tendon and tendons by definition connect muscle to bone, connect the quadriceps to the patella or the kneecap, and then the patellar tendon attaches to the tibia. And that mechanism is what allows us to straighten our leg, but it's also a very important decelerator uh, when we're going downhill, for example, or downstairs. Um, and then if we go further, uh, this slide will change. We've taken off all the soft tissue and this is what we call the intra-articular part of the knee. So it's in the knee joint. And this is where most of the really cool action occurs is in the joint. So again, this is looking at a right knee if it's bent and you're looking straight onto the femur, we've just removed the patella. So there's four major bones in the knee, the patella, the femur, the big thigh bone, the tibia, the shin, and then the fibula on the outside. And there's four major ligaments. They're the ones on the side that give a side to side stability. And unlike tendons that connect muscle to bone, ligaments by definition connect bone to bone. And that's what gives us our stability uh, in the knee. So when you tear a ligament, usually that will lead to instability. So this is the MCL on the inside of this right knee model. Here's the lateral collateral ligament, it's more cord-like. And then um, the two in the middle are the ones that really get most of the press or the cruciates. And they're called the cruciates because they cross the anterior cruciate lives in front of the posterior cruciate, and the anterior cruciate is a little smaller and weaker, hence it's injured more commonly. And this part of the knee right here is called the notch, and I'll bring that up later. The notch is where the cruciate ligaments live. So we have four bones, four ligaments, and we have two types of cartilage in the knee. The smooth glistening cartilage, maybe you've seen that on the end of the chicken bone, is what we call hyaline cartilage. Um, and it's on the end of the femur, on top of the tibia, and underneath the kneecap. And when people develop arthritis, which we'll talk about later, this is the cartilage that wears out. The other cartilage is the meniscus, which is this shock absorber between the femur and tibia. And it helps distribute load, and it really helps protect 
this smooth cartilage. It also gives us a little bit of stability. So this arrow is pointing down because that's gonna be our next view. If we remove the femur and look down on the tibia, this is what the meniscus looks like. So this is the medial meniscus and this is the lateral or outside meniscus. And another concept is that the knee, that the knee has three compartments and this becomes very important when people do develop arthritis and we start having a discussion about doing a partial or a total knee. So you have this medial, lateral compartment, and then this compartment up here between the kneecap uh, and the femur. But you can see how the meniscus is kind of hollow in the middle, um, and the lateral meniscus has a little bit more mobility to it because it has a weak attachment in the back, and it's more circular than the uh, medial meniscus. And this is what it would look like if we looked at a normal knee arthroscopically. You can see how nice and clean the femoral articular cartilage and the tibial articular cartilage, and this is a normal appearing meniscus. And a very important uh, thing to understand is if this smooth cartilage, the hyaline cartilage on the femur and tibia is very efficient as a bearing surface. And if you look, take, for example, ice on ice, this number represents what we call the coefficient of friction. And this number is the coefficient of friction of cartilage on cartilage. So it's four times more efficient as a bearing surface than ice on ice is. And this is a busy slide, but really all this is showing are the forces on the kneecap, uh, secondary to the muscles around the knee. And with the knee straight, the forces aren't that great. Here's the kneecap, but when you start bending your knee, the kneecap really gets compressed into the femur and there's actually more stress on the cartilage underneath the kneecap than any cartilage in the body. And that's why it wears out a lot. And that's why people develop pain going, for example, up or down stairs is because they're overloading the cartilage underneath the kneecap. So we're gonna talk about five common causes uh, now that we uh, know the anatomy. Uh, we're gonna talk real briefly about overuse injuries, uh, cartilage injuries, meniscal, and articular cartilage, ligament, briefly on fracture, then we're gonna spend some time uh, on arthritis because that's a very common topic uh, these days. So patellar tendonitis is also called runner's knee or jumper's knee. And that's just from overuse. Maybe if you have a tight quadriceps or tight hamstrings and you do those type of activities, you're gonna overload the tendon and develop inflammation uh, in the patellar tendon. This condition, as well as the other ones we're gonna talk about, very rarely require surgery and they respond very well to activity modification physical therapy, ice, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, and usually they run their course and go away with time. Iliotibial band syndrome, the iliotibial or IT band is a thick band that goes from basically your pelvis down to the tibia. And what can happen on the knee is where the femur bone flares, if you have a tight IT band, and a lot of times that's associated with tight hamstrings as well, it can rub on the bone uh, and cause inflammation in a little bursa, which is just a fluid-filled sac. Uh, and it causes pain, unlike runner's knee in front of the knee, it's more toward the side of the knee. And patellofemoral pain is probably one of the most common things that I see in the office. And again, it's because that one slide I showed all the stress on the cartilage underneath the kneecap. And especially this time of year, people that are predisposed to it, especially skiers, skiing is a bent knee position sport. And over time, you just overload it. And I get a lot of achy uh, knee pain that comes in this time of year. But again, usually it'll respond very well uh, to non-operative treatment. Now we're gonna talk about the meniscus a little bit. And this meniscus is a very uh, unique structure. Um, it has what we call type one collagen. That's not really that important for this talk. But what is important is that it has minimal blood supply. Its main blood supply is out on the periphery. So this inner portion of it doesn't have blood supply. So it does not have the ability uh, to heal itself. Um, it also transmit load between the femur and tibia, more so when the knee is bent or in flexion than when it's straight or in extension. And we know from long-term studies that people that have lost their meniscus or have had meniscus tears, it doesn't matter if it's torn or if you've had surgery and it's been removed, you're predisposed to develop arthritis because of wear and tear um, of the cartilage on the femur and tibia because of the loss of that protective mechanism that the meniscus gives us. And most meniscus tears occur without any particular significant trauma. It could be simply uh, just walking on un uneven surfaces. And a lot of times people don't notice it. 
Uh, later on, they'll have achiness in the knee. The symptoms tend to wax uh, and wane, um, but usually they don't go away if you have a torn meniscus because the meniscus usually does not heal itself. And this is an MRI looking at the knee from the side. And this is what a normal meniscus looks like. If you remember that one anatomy slide, it's hollow in the middle. So if you look at it from the slot side, you're gonna have a wedge in back and a wedge in front. And this is what a, a meniscus tear would look like where you lose that definition in the back and here's that fragment. So it should be back here. We call this a bucket handle tear. And a lot of times these uh, we see in association with other injuries like ACL injuries, but they can occur in isolation as well. And so when you go in and scope a knee that has an MRI like that, this is what it looks like. So again, here's the normal meniscus, but here's the torn meniscus. It should be attached back here. And this is a nice clean tear and it's in a part of the meniscus that probably has a little bit of blood supply. So rather than removing this, we want to uh, preserve the meniscus uh, because of its important function to preserve this cartilage up above. So what we would do here is repair it. And this is that same knee when we put some stitches arthroscopically into that meniscus to preserve it. I can tell you that probably only 10 to 15% of meniscus tears I see are repairable. Most of them are like this. They occur in an area of the meniscus that does not have good blood supply. So we just go in and trim the meniscus. And generally, if we take out less than 30% of the meniscus, people are not gonna have any significant long-term issues. The other injury is that we can see sometimes traumatic injuries to that smooth cartilage. So this would be a traumatic isolated injury to the articular cartilage, unlike arthritis, which is more of a diffuse issue. So you can see this lesion here where the cartilage is basically laminated off the bone. And in this particular case, we clean off the edges and we poke little holes in the bone to stimulate blood flow like this. This is called a microfracture. Maybe you've heard of that term. Um, and microfractures have, have good short-term results, uh, but generally those results will uh, fade after five to seven years. So there are other options. This is kind of a cool way to treat large cartilage lesions where we take a plug of bone and cartilage from the knee in an area where you don't need it. So we take these plugs from up above the kneecap and what we do is we fill the defect with those plugs. So this is what is generally termed a mosaic plasty uh, and it's a very cool way to address the problem. Another way this is very busy is if we were not expecting someone to have a lesion and we go in and see one like that, we can take a biopsy of their normal cartilage and we send it to a lab in Boston and they grow cartilage cells. And once we get a specific number, we go back in. So it's a two-stage two procedure and we'll put the cells in here and cover it with a little patch to keep them there and sew it in. So that's called ACI. And uh, those are the main ways to treat cartilage injuries on the end of the bone. If you have a really huge lesion, then the one thing I didn't show that you can do, and I've actually had it done to my knee, is uh, use a cadaver graft. So you take the very end of a cadaver femur and you match the size of lesion of that patient and you take that out of the cadaver and you transport it to the site of injury. So we're gonna change gears now and go to ligament tears. Uh, the MCL, the medial collateral ligament, is the most commonly injured ligament in the knee. Um, it can be a contact injury, and it usually is in contact sports like soccer or football. We see a lot in skiing as well, um, just from catching an edge uh, and the ski being turned outward. But it's this ligament in here. So you can see if the knee is pushed in, you're going to compress out here, you're going to distract out here, and the ligament will tear. A lot of times people feel a pop, sometimes they don't. But I can tell you most MCL injuries heal with bracing, icing, therapy, and over-the-counter medication, and they take about six or eight weeks uh, to heal. And the reason they heal, unlike ACL injuries, which we're going to talk about, is because it's what we call extra-articular. It's outside of the knee joint, so it's an environment conducive to healing. In the knee joint, because of the chemical nature and physical nature uh, in the knee, ligaments tend not to heal on the road. On their own, but the MCL generally does. So this is a slide of uh, a normal ACL, and the ACL has two bundles, and you kind of see them pretty well here, uh, posterior lateral and the anterior medial bundle. This is a torn ACL, and it usually tears up here on the femur, and that's what this is showing. 
And in this community, we have a lot of active people. They want to get back to their activity. And most of the time, the way they're going to get back is by having surgery where we put tissue in um, to replicate the ACL. There's been some recent literature in going in and repairing ACLs, but really the general treatment of choice is to reconstruct it, meaning using other tissue to act as a substitute. Certainly there are certain people out there that uh, are living without ACLs and are very active, but most people lack confidence in their knee. And the worst thing that can happen is if you have an unstable knee, is if the knee gives out on you, then you can injure other structures like that meniscus or the articular cartilage. So by going in and reconstructing an ACL, we're trying to prevent that from happening and give people a knee they have confidence in and can get back to their activities. Around here in skiing, there's two main mechanisms for ACL tears. This is the most common, it's called the phantom foot. It's usually when you get in the back seat, your hips get below your knees, you fight it, so you have a very strong, aggressive quad quadriceps contraction, and the quad, because it attaches to the front of the tibia, pulls the tibia forward, and the main function of the ACL is to prevent the tibia from coming forward on the femur. So that, along with the ski, which is a very long lever arm, so the downhill ski, a lot of times you'll catch an edge and it'll torque the knee. So the combination of the quadriceps contraction with the torque of the ski will tear the ACL. The other mechanism is called boot induced. Usually that's when you're coming down off of a jump and you land more back or posterior and it pushes the tibia forward and it snaps uh, the ACL. Most of the time people will hear a pop um, and they'll get swelling and pain. Um, and uh, they'll come see us in the, the office within a day or two. Now, if we look at the incidence, it's about one in 3,000 individuals. It's much more frequent in the younger, more active uh, group. Females, and we'll talk about this in a minute, are at greater risk than males for ACL tears. Um, there's about 350 reconstructions done a year, uh, so there's quite a bit of ACL injuries out there. So this, I think, very interesting, is if we look at sports and ACL tears, and in basketball, for example, for every one male, three and a half females will tear their ACLs, similar for volleyball, similar for soccer, but for skiing, it's six to one females for males. And I'll answer why uh, right now. And the main risk factors, there are some anatomic ones. One is that women in particular um, are more knock need, and that, that's what valgus is if you're knock need, and that can put stress on the ACL. That notch where the ACL and PCL live can be narrower in females. So if you hyperextend your knee, it can kind of guillotine the ACL. Women have smaller ACLs, so they're not as strong. Um, and uh, it's thought that maybe the hormones have a role uh, during uh, the menstrual cycle where the ACL is more susceptible to being torn. But the main reason is right here. It's the poor neuromuscular control, and I'll describe that in a minute. And it usually has to do with poor landing mechanisms. Uh, and also women generally are more double jointed, which is what hyperlaxity means than males. So that makes them a little bit more susceptible. So this um, was something that was studied by a guy named Tim Hewitt when he was in Cincinnati. I think he's at the Mayo Clinic now. And in jumping or landing sports that females are involved in like volleyball and basketball, this is how they tend to land. And this is a schematic here showing it where the femur, the big thigh bone rotates in, the tibia rotates out, the knee goes in and it snaps the ACL. So this is a very high risk position for an ACL tear. Um, what he showed and by doing neuromuscular training, so maybe you've heard of like these ACL prevention programs. And basically what they're doing is they're retraining the muscles to teach you how to land like this, which is a much safer position uh, to be in and can pr protect your ACL. And the ACL pr prevention programs are very, very uh, effective. So this is the neuromuscular part of why women tear the ACL. And so the diagnosis, I can tell 90% of the time just by listening to the patient, how they injured it, what they were doing, did they hear a pop, did they feel instability, et cetera. Physical exam, uh, there are certain tools that we use on physical exam. Mainly what we do, we stabilize the femur and pull forward on the tibia. And if it comes forward more than it should, or if, or if it doesn't have what we call an endpoint, that's consistent with an ACL tear. Uh, the ACL is also very important in rotational stability, and something called a pivot shift test allows us to check for that as well. 
And then typically we'll get an MRI uh, to confirm it. And this is a normal ACL. You can see it attaching, looking at the knee from the side, from the femur to the tibia, and this is a torn ACL. You can see how you lose continuity of the tissue here. So there it's torn. A lot of times we get MRIs to make sure though, that there's not other injuries associated with an ACL, because even though we see a lot of isolated ACL tears, meniscus tears, MCL tears, other ligament injuries can occur uh, in conjunction with that. And so this is an arthroscopic view looking in the notch, um, again, of a right knee. And this kind of white is where the normal ACL attaches. So when we go in to reconstruct an ACL, uh, we want to replicate that anatomy. And these two circles kind of represent that anterior medial and posterior lateral bundle. And what we want to do is kind of put the graft in that position where it incorporates both of them. And this is kind of showing the tunnel kind of right in the middle of this white area uh, because the most common reason that ACL surgery doesn't work is probably technical. If you don't put the tunnels in the right position, there's going to be more stress on the graft and it's going to fail. So especially on the femur, it's very, very important to get it as far back as possible uh, and recreate the normal anatomy. And these are just some of the tools that we use in surgery to make sure we get it right. Again, we do it arthroscopically, so we do it through small incisions. Uh, again, a right knee, looking at the guide, and that's where we want our hole to come, and this is us just drilling the hole. And this is just a, a different technique, but really doing the same thing. So when we do grafts, you have one of two choices. You can do what's called an autograft to, to reconstruct your ACL, which is your own tissue. And this is a picture of a hamstring graft. Uh, and I've done uh, hundreds of hamstrings and patellar tendon is the other graft. But most recently, we've done a lot of quad tendon grafts. I just don't have a good picture of the quad tendon, so I didn't show it. So what we do is in young people, we always use your own tissue. If you're over uh, 40, which I still consider that young in the 40s, but if you're over 40, we tend to use allograft or cadaver tissue. Uh, less trauma or what we call morbidity to the knee a little quicker early rehab, less pain. Uh, but this is an example of the hamstrings, semitendinosus gracilis, and then we fold them over uh, to get a nice graft. And then after we drill our tunnels in the femur and tibia, we pass it through the knee, and this is what a reconstructed ACL would look like. And these are all people that you guys probably recognize, maybe not these basketball players, but the GOAT, Tom Brady, and uh, Tiger and Lindsay, all these people have had ACL injuries, ACL reconstructions, and have gone back to very uh, high level uh, activity. Uh, if you look at the literature, though, if you look at elite athletes, only about 50% of them will get back uh, to the level of sport that they were before. And last but not least, our own Chris Klug from this valley, who won a bronze medal in the Salt Lake Olympics after having he actually had a multi-ligament knee that we fixed, ACL, LCL, meniscus tear, biceps avulsion, but that's not nearly as impressive as not only did, it, did he win a bronze after having that injury and surgery, but also after a liver transplant. So a pretty amazing athlete. So we'll change gears a little bit again and just talk about fractures. And tibial plateau fractures, we see a lot of in this valley. We see a lot of them mainly skiing. In other parts of the world, it's mainly high energy uh, from motor vehicle accidents. And this is a CT scan just showing a fracture. And this is how we fix it, generally with plate and screws, because we're trying to recreate. And that articular cartilage that I was showing you on those anatomy slides, we're trying to make that as normal as possible. Because in tibial plateaus, that's disrupted. Uh, so there's a pretty high risk, even making it look perfect like this, that you'll go on to develop some arthritis. This one is a little more subtle, but it's an interesting case. This is looking at the right knee from the front. You can see the inside, or what we call the medial tibial plateau is nice and smooth, but there's something going on here. You can't really tell. If you look at it from the side, it looks like something is pushed down a little bit here. This is where the MRI is very helpful. In the MRI, you can see that this is pushed down. So what happens on this tibial plateau fractures, the femur actually acts like a hammer. And unfortunately, the tibial is the nail. The tibia usually loses the fight. It's a weaker bone than the femur. So this same patient, we did this arthroscopically, we went in, here's the meniscus that you guys know all about now, here's the normal articular cartilage, and this is the part that's pushed down. And so what we do arthroscopically, we're able to push it back up, we put some bone graft underneath it to act as a buttress, 
And then we fix it in this situation with two screws because it wasn't a huge fragment. Now this uh, patient I lost contact with, but she came back and saw me 14 years later because of another issue. And her right knee was doing great, but on the x-rays we took when she came back in, you can see if you look at the outside where she had that fracture, how it's a little narrower than the other knee. And so when we see narrowing there, that tells me that that hyaline or articular cartilage is starting to thin out because that cartilage does not show up on x-ray. And so if you have good normal thick cartilage, you're gonna have normal spacing. When it starts to wear out, we see narrowing. That's why we always get weight bearing x-rays because they can even show us subtle changes with early arthritis. And so we went in 14 years later because she had another issue with a meniscus tear over here, but this is what her cartilage looked like, which I think looked pretty good where she had that previous fracture. And this one's more obvious where this femur came down. So this femur basically, when this gentleman injured his knee was down here at one point. And so this is all pushed down. This is the articular cartilage. And this is one we did open through an incision, elevated everything, bone grafted and fixed it. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about is arthritis. Uh, because all of these conditions I've talked about, except for the overuse injuries, meniscus tears, hyaline cartilage injuries, and ACL or ligament injuries can all lead to arthritis. And it is the leading cause of physical disability in the United States, affects millions of people, and it costs billions of dollars uh, to treat on an annual basis. So this is what arthritis looks like when you start getting wear and tear of the cartilage. And the reason it hurts is that normal cartilage has no nerve endings, but once it wears out, the bone underneath is exposed and the bone is very, very sensitive. And then the lining of the knee, which you don't see here, called the synovium causes swelling and inflammation, and that can lead to uh, more pain and stiffness. And this is what arthritis um, looks like arthroscopically. You can see how rough this is rather than being smooth like on the tibia. So the symptoms are generally pain with weight bearing, swelling, stiffness, you can get deformity, depending on what compartment is involved, you can get knock need, uh, or bow-legged deformity, uh, generally is to decrease activity. So then you get that cycle of weight gain. People uh, get depression. It can lead to or worsen diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension. And these are all collateral damages from uh, the arthritis. Most of the treatment, at least early on, is not operative. In my practice alone, I take care of a lot of people with arthritis for years and years before they have to have surgery. And that involves over-the-counter medication like Tylenol or the NSAIDs, which is ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is the active ingredient, Motrin uh, or Advil or the naproxen products like Aleve. Supplements like glucosamine can be helpful. There's not great science behind it, but some people swear by it. We do a lot of injections. Sometimes we'll use orthotics if people do have a deformity to unload the part uh, that is arthritic. And we also use braces to do that, what's called an unloader brace. Physical therapy can help and certainly weight loss. For every pound of weight that you lose, that's taking four to five pounds off of your knee. So it's very important people that are overweight that have arthritis to try to lose weight, but it's difficult because uh, it's hard to exercise when your, your joints hurt. But swimming, biking, those types of activities are usually pretty well, well tolerated. Now the operative treatment is either gonna be a partial or a total knee replacement. And these are just some of the injections we do I'd say the workhorse or cortisone based. There's a new one we've been using now for a couple of years called Zoretta, which is a long acting slow release, which we've had great uh, results with. And it doesn't have some of those deleterious effects of cortisone on the cartilage uh, or uh, like increasing your blood sugar. So it's very safe. We've been doing a lot of that. Hyaluronic acid, uh, something that they started in horses and uh, we found that it worked very well. Probably about 25 years ago, we started doing it in humans, and we still do a lot of hyaluronic acid. It's not as strong as an anti-inflammatory. I tell people to think of it like a WD-40. It's more of a lubricant, and it helps create more of a natural environment in the knee. We also do quite a bit of PRP, which is platelet with plasma, uh, and we do some stem cells. But if you look at the literature, it probably supports PRP more than stem cells at this time uh, for treating arthritis. There's another talk. Uh, in these series of talks that we're giving uh, based on all these injections. So I'm not gonna uh, really get into that at this point unless you have any specific questions. So surgery, uh, we're gonna talk mainly about joint replacement. And here you can see the trend, this is total knee replacements. And we're probably doing about a million knee replacements in the US on an annual basis. These are total hips. So there's a lot more total knees than 
than uh, hips. So why are we doing so many knees? Well, one is that we're living longer, uh, even though, except for 2020, actually the life expectancy went down, but that was because of COVID. Uh, but generally you can see that there's an upward trend. And a very interesting fact is that um, of all 65 year olds in the history of the world, two thirds of them are alive today. And that just tells you how old our population is. And there's also this 12050 rule that for every one 20 year old alive in the world today, there's 20 50 year olds. So we, as we get older, things wear out. That's why we're doing more uh, total knees. A lot of it is technology based as well because the techniques have gotten better, uh, et cetera. So this is probably my favorite slide in the talk. Uh, not only are we getting older, but we want to stay active. This guy's name is Fauja Singh. He was the first 100-year-old to run and complete uh, a marathon. And he did several after he was 100. Another problem in the U.S., not so much in this valley, uh, but elsewhere in the United States, it's obesity. Uh, so you can imagine that the more weight we're putting on our joints, um, they're just going to wear out quicker. And so this is what happens when you get arthritis. You know, you start getting bone on bone. And I talked earlier about the knee having three compartments. This out, so, so this is a right knee looking at it from the front. This part looks normal, this is worn out. So in a situation like this, we would do a partial replacement where we just replace the femur and tibia on that side. So we leave all the ligaments. So the knee acts like a normal knee. We take out minimal bone. Um, and this is what it looks like radiographically where we do a partial replacement. And I would say in the last 10 years, you know, I've done hundreds of partials uh, and I've been in practice now uh, almost 26 years. My first 15 years, I could probably count on one hand how many partials I did. And that was because the literature back then, they just didn't do well because they were difficult. Uh, you couldn't see that well um, and they just failed. But this was a game changer, the Makoplasty, which is the robot. It came out about 10 years ago, initially just to do partials. In the last three years, we've been able to do total knee replacements with it. And I do all my partials, all my totals with the Makoplasty robot. And so this is the robot. And the main part we utilize is this arm that has a burr or a saw. And basically it just helps us cut the bone and it makes sure that we cut it correctly every time. So it takes out the subjectivity of it. A traditional total knee and partial knee, you have an instrument, you kind of look at it uh, and they do well, but you say, yeah, that looks good, let's take it. Where this one takes out all of that because um, we, we do this 3D imaging that I'll show you in a minute. So when the partials came out, it took care of this problem. We knew what to do with a little focal cartilage injury. That's where we do either the microfracture, take the plugs uh, or do the uh, culture of the cells or if it's completely worn out, we do a total knee. But it was kind of a dilemma of what to do in these. And then when the Mako came out and we started doing these partials, people did great and it kind of gave us a solution to that problem. And so this is what we do. We do, do a three-dimensional CT scan before surgery. So we're able to look at the bone. I'm able to put the correct size exactly where it needs to go before I even cut skin. So we do all this preoperatively. And so the green on this picture is where the component goes. And the green on the tibia is this, and this is actually showing a burr. And then what we do is the burr, it's kind of like a video game um, where you just cut out the green and when you get rid of all the green, you know you cut out all your bone. And really uh, the, the impressive part about this is that if this little burr gets outside of this area, it will shut off. It will not allow you to cut bone that you're not supposed to cut. And this is actually the first Mako we did. This was one of our fellows um, that we were teaching, Dr. Purnell, you can kind of see him in the background. Juan is back here. But anyway, this is a, a right knee and these are what we call arrays. This is how we communicate with the robot through infrared light. And so I'm calibrating the little arm here with a burr. And so we were doing a partial on that individual. And then once we cut the bone, we put those components in. And again, we start out with arthritis and we replace it with metal and plastic. And that's what it looks like radiographically. And this is kind of a typical post-op. This is uh, obviously, I'm just going to show you my best patients. Uh, but so this is four weeks. You can see they get their motion back very quick. But it is uh, really a great operation for the right person. This 
person here who's starting to get some deformity and bow leggedness this has an x-ray like this will not do well with a partial. And the main reason why is one, because of the deformity, but also because more than one compartment uh, is involved. So that's where we have to do a total. So we have the same setup. Uh, you can see we wear the space suits. We change our gloves multiple times. Um, we do everything ultra sterile as much as we can to prevent any complications. Uh, and this is me just looking up at the screen. So I'm not even looking at the knee, I'm looking at the screen when I'm cutting the bone. And so this is what I'm doing here. I'm cutting off this green here. I have the saw that's on the robot. The knee is down in this area. And then once we cut the bone, we put the components in and that's what it looks like. And I'm just showing you kind of how we cut the bone on the saw bones because you can see it in my pictures. We really don't take off much bone. So we leave the collateral ligaments. We leave the MCL and LCL. We always take out the ACL because uh, it's really difficult to do a total knee. Uh, leaving the ACL in. 50-50 um, in the United States, if people take out the posterior cruciate or, or leave it, the results are about the same. I used to take it on everybody. Now I leave it on most people unless they have a severe deformity. Uh, so these are what the bone cuts look like. And then these are what the components in place. So the bone we cut is really the same size as the components. So we're not taking off uh, a lot of bone when we do that. And these are what the typical x-rays look like. And again, this is what a post-op patient. So the scars generally heal pretty well. Uh, post-op range of motion is mainly dictated by preoperative range of motion. So if you have an extremely stiff knee pre-op, you may not get full motion back, but you should get at least the motion that you had preoperatively. And these are all some familiar faces of people that uh, have had total knees and have gone on to live very uh, productive lives. So what seems to work best for my patients? Um, Non-operative treatment, uh, for arthritis anyway, uh, therapy, exercise, I think diet is important, especially when uh, weight is involved. Uh, Non-steroidal medications, Tylenol. If people have night pain, especially arthritis, sometimes we do prescribe tramadol, which is a pain medicine, uh, but it doesn't have the addictive properties of some of the other opioids. Um, we always correct alignment. Um, be it with an unloader brace or a little uh, heel wedge that goes into a shoe when we treat them non-operatively. Injection therapy is a big part of my practice. And if that all fails, then we uh, talk about uh, surgery. So the sun has uh, set on this talk and um, I will now, uh, let me just show you real quick the talks that are coming up. Uh, just if you guys are interested in, in any of these, write them down. Uh, on your calendar. Um, so it looks like we're doing them uh, monthly, uh, pretty much up through December. And again, if there's any particular topics that you don't see here, let us know. And uh, the next round of talks, uh, we, we can maybe uh, talk about that. So I'm going to go up here in my questions and answers and, and see, um, see what we have here. So I, I have a question um, about the su success rate for torn ACL. Um, and what about second or third tears? Um, so if you have a second or third one, uh, then obviously the success wasn't very good on the first one. But I can tell you this, it's, it's kind of a loaded question because not all ACLs are the same. If you have an isolated ACL tear um, and nothing else is going on, uh, meaning there's no meniscus tear and no other ligaments that are injured, uh, you're going to have 85, 90% success rate. There is about, if you look at the literature, probably about a 10 to 15% re-tear rate. And interestingly enough, there's actually a higher re-tear rate. If someone tears their ACL and say they're in their 20s, they have a higher chance of tearing the other knee's ACL than they do of re-tearing their reconstructed ACL. So the success rate is pretty good. If you failed a ACL reconstruction, then um, either it was a technical issue, okay? I mean, you could just have bad luck and you were skiing or doing something aggressive and you can tear it again. I mean, if you tear your native one, you can tear a reconstructive one. Or there was some other kind of instability, like a subtle, what we call posterior lateral instability that wasn't recognized. Um, 
We also look at the bone, the very top of the tibia. If you have what's called increased tibial slope, that puts more stress on the ACL. That can lead to tears. And some of those things aren't really looked at that closely by some people that do them preoperatively. So it's very important to make sure that there aren't other things going on. I can tell you this, like most surgeries, when you failed one, uh, and this has to do with knee replacements or ACLs, the second or third one generally don't do as well. So you want to get it right the first time. But because of the aggressive rehabilitation after ACL surgeries these days, a lot of people feel like that that reconstructed knee is stronger than their knee was before, uh, just from all the strengthening, et cetera. So I hope that uh, helps answer that. Uh, I have another question. How many years can I expect um, my full tear reconstruction to last? It should last your, your lifetime. Um, so I would expect, you know, for you to, if you've rehabbed it correctly and your surgery went well, uh, it should last you your lifetime. Having said that, we do know that people that have a torn ACL, even a reconstructed ACL that's done technically perfectly, there's still an increased risk of developing uh, arthritis. So you should have stability, hopefully forever, but there is a risk that you are gonna get some arthritis down the line, even if you haven't had a meniscus tear, um, et cetera. And that has to do with when you tear the ACL, the chemical nature of the knee changes. So you have more of what we call cytokines, which are good and bad, but there's more bad ones that help. Um, they don't help, but they, degrade the cartilage and that happens after an ACL tear, even after reconstruction. Um, so uh, we also know based on our MRI studies that there's a very high rate of bone bruising when you tear the ACL because the ACL is, there's some compression involved as well. And similar to a tibial plateau fracture, the femur comes down and hits the tibia and it'll bruise it. So even though you go in arthroscopically, and the cartilage may look normal, there's gonna be some microscopic injury that over time may manifest itself in, in arthritis. Uh, so I have another question. Uh, if someone has bone on bone on one side of the knee, what injection would you recommend? Um, and why that particular one? Uh, it depends a lot on how much swelling there is. Uh, so if someone has a lot of swelling in their knee, when we do the injection, we will aspirate or take the fluid out but if someone has an angry swollen knee, I'm going to want as strong of an anti-inflammatory as I can in there. So I would probably recommend a Zilretta or a cortisone-based injection because those are strong anti-inflammatories. And you can do those. Uh, the Zilretta, you can do every four to six months. But for example, if I inject that long-acting cortisone and people get only two months relief, then at that point, I'll talk to them about supplementing it with a hyaluronic acid injection. So you can kind of do and stagger both. Uh, people that have mild to moderate arthritis, especially on one side of the knee, what we have found in our practice that works well is to combine the hyaluronic acid with PRP. So, um, and there's a product called Orthovisc, which is three injections done weekly. And with the first and third one, I will do PRP and we've had very good uh, results uh, doing that. Um, I'm so happy that you and your team will be performing high right, total joint. <laughs> All right, well, we, I look forward to, uh, we look forward to doing that. I'm sure you'll do great. Um, do you use any PRP injections after surgery? Uh, I don't with a total knee replacement. Uh, years ago, I used to do PRP intraoperatively uh, with every total knee, but uh, we looked at that data and there are no difference in the ones we did it and we didn't do it. So. And it's pretty expensive, so we uh, we stop doing it routinely. Um, uh, discuss success with PRP and stem cells in arthritic knees. Um, and at one point in the degradation of the knee, do these therapies still work? They work best on mild to moderate arthritis. If you have what we call end stage arthritis and a lot of deformity, uh, it's really uh, probably not not gonna, gonna help you much. Um, in my practice, I do, we do some stem cells, but I do a lot more PRP. Um, 
and we've had really good, really good results with it. So PRP, you basically take blood from your arm and you spin it in a centrifuge and you separate the cells from the fluid. And then you spin it some more and you separate platelets, which are these little round cells. Their main function is to stop bleeding. Like when we cut ourselves, but what we have found over the years is that they have a tremendous amount of growth factors and uh, anti-inflammatory properties. So uh, they work, work very well. And there's some good literature coming out to support that. Uh, not enough yet where um, Medicare and insurance companies will pay for it. So some of them I think are starting to, but most of them still don't. But I bet in the next two or three years, it'll be common practice for it to be covered. Uh, can stem cell therapy be the first choice, choice for meniscus tear? Uh, currently, no pain, no major issues, but the MRI shows some large flap tear and a few cracks here and there. Uh, it can be, but it's probably uh, not good, good medicine to do that. And, you know, when I think about treatment and what I should do, uh, for some reason, the way my mind works, I think, okay, if I'm taking my oral boards to be board certified, in orthopedic surgery. And one of the cases they present to me is a meniscus tear. And if I said, oh, I would treat that with stem cell therapy, I would fail my boards. So you can do it, but it's probably not good medicine and not recommended. Having said that, if you feel very strongly about it and you're willing to pay for it because it's thousands of dollars, uh, then you could talk me into it, but I would probably try to talk into some other types of treatments. Some most meniscus tears don't heal. And um, you can try a cortisone injection to settle the knee down, but generally that's only temporary. Then your symptoms will come back. And the natural history of meniscus tears, because they don't have good blood supplies, if they get bigger over time. So the longer you wait, especially if it's symptomatic, the bigger the tear is going to be. And then when it starts to bother you more and you decide, hey, I'm going to have my knee scoped and have it cleaned out, you're going to lose more of the meniscus. So we're pretty aggressive um, about going in and scoping symptomatic knees that have meniscus tears. Having said that, uh, a lot of people bring up studies that have shown that arthroscopy doesn't help meniscus tears. And, uh, and that's actually not true. There are studies out there like that, but you have to look closely at the studies. Most of those studies were done in people that had underlying arthritis as well. So if we go in and scope a knee that has a meniscus tear and there's nothing else going on, you're going to do great. If it's one that we just trim out, don't have to take a lot out, you do great, but if you have underlying arthritis, then I cannot cure your arthritis with a scope and you're probably still gonna have uh, some pain. But everything else being equal, if you have a symptomatic meniscus tear, arthroscopy and cleaning it out is the treatment. It's a 15 minute procedure, crutches for a day, back doing everything in four weeks. Uh, are stem cells a viable non-surgical treatment? Uh, kind of just what I said. Uh, there are a lot of stem cell centers out there and you just got to be careful because um, a lot of things they advertise, uh, there's just not science to support it. And, and I'm huge on science. I mean, I think experimental treatment is great, but I don't want to be one doing experimental treatment on my patients. Um, so you, so you got to be careful. Uh, but if you have, like in my practice, I would use stem cells mainly for arthritis. And again, if it was mild to moderate, uh, if you weren't a surgical candidate um, and you're willing to pay for it, then, then absolutely it, it is a viable option. But I would try some other injections uh, that have better science behind them at this point first. If I've been having injections every six months and it seems to last four to five, can I continue to do the type? Can I continue to do that and what type if it's just a single injection? Yeah, you can absolutely continue to do that. If you get four to five months, um, you know, you can repeat them every six months and that other month or six weeks, you can treat it symptomatically with icing and over-the-counter medication. Um, and again, everybody's different. Some people, if they responded very well to the Zoretta, the long-acting steroid, I'd recommend doing that. If not, then I would do the hyaluronic acid. Uh, and then again, we'd have that discussion about combining the hyaluronic acid with the PRP uh, if your arthritis isn't uh, in stage. If I have a torn meniscus, will it create arthritis quicker? If I don't have surgery, it, it certainly can. Um, what I tell my patients generally is that it's better to have less stable meniscus 
than a torn meniscus because every time you're putting weight on that knee, that rough surface is irritating the cartilage on the femur, uh, on the top side and on the tibia underneath. Uh, so uh, yes, I think you are gonna create arthritis quicker if you have a known symptomatic meniscus tear uh, and you leave it alone, especially if you're um, involved in, in any weight bearing activities. When would you look to do a revision on a total knee? Um, you, there are sometimes you have to do a revision, like if you have something catastrophic happen, uh, like a post-operative infection, uh, then generally you have to have a revision. Uh, if you have loosening uh, of the components, um, then that's gonna lead to a revision. If you have a lot of what we call osteolysis or bony changes, uh, next to the component and that's causing pain, then uh, you may need a revision. Um, there's probably about anywhere from one to 5% of total knees that the surgery went perfect, x-rays look perfect and they have pain. Um, are you gonna do a revision on that knee? I'd, I'd probably try not to do it unless the pain was significant. If technically something uh, went wrong in your initial knee, was malaligned or malrotated, uh, that can cause pain, then uh, you may need a revision. But we try to stay away from them. Revision knees uh, just generally don't do as well as a primary knee. So we always uh, strive to get it right the first time. All right, if you guys have any other questions, we'll take a look at them and uh, we'll get back to you uh, by email. And I'd like to thank everybody uh, for attending. So I, uh, I really enjoyed giving this talk. Thank you.